Well, thank you, Amy. That was fantastic. And it's just really great to have everyone with us this morning. I went to sleep last Sunday night with two problems. The first problem is I didn't know what I would speak on this morning. And the second problem made that problem a whole lot worse because I struggle with the thought of traditional messages on traditional days. It's just one of those things that I've sort of, it's dogged me my whole life. I I just hate the traditional being sort of predictable. And so I went to sleep with these two problems and I asked and I asked God and I prayed and I said, what do you want me to speak about today? Monday morning, I woke up as clear, as clear as anything. I knew what we were to do today. So what we're going to do, we're going to go back 2,000 years to that very first Easter Sunday, and we're going to have a look at this Easter Sunday through, through three sets of eyes. And the first set of eyes is going to be one of Jesus' disciples. And when we get to the third set of eyes, there's a twist. And you'll find out what I'm talking about when we get there. So we're going we're gonna to start with one set of eyes. And I need your help. I need you to uh, put a little type in on your comments because I'm going to make this worth your while. I actually have a little Easter bunny here. And we're going to send that to whoever can guess the name of this disciple, the first person to guess it. We're going to send this by courier pigeon. It's going to have no little viruses on it. It'll be clean when it arrives. It won't be eaten. And it's for you. So this is your opportunity. And I've got Amy. She's going to tell me who gets there first. So I'll just put that down for a sec. I'm going to grab this. And so just to start with, I'll give you a few clues as to who this person is. They are mentioned 12 times in the first four gospel narratives. Almost more than any other disciple they're mentioned by name. They're also one of the most controversial of all the disciples. And it actually isn't, <clears throat> it isn't actually of their own making. It's what other people have done. So two or three hundred years after their life, there was a book written. And that book has confused. It was written in the second or third century. That's confused about this person, created controversy. And a film was made on information in that book. In about 1591, a pope, Pope Gregory, preached a whole series of messages on this disciple, but they, they were confused, they got it wrong, and they combined other Bible characters with this person. Now, the mess that that created was not cleared up till 1969 when the Catholic Church made it very clear that dear old Pope Gregory got it very far wrong. Any ideas? Have we had anyone? Yeah, any? Jeff thinks it might be Peter. Peter. Well, Jeff. You're amazing. I don't know how you got that from that, but that's very <laughs> clever, but you're so wrong. We're going we're gonna to keep going, right? Oh. And, and so any other ideas there, Amy? Mm, I think they're thinking. They're thinking. Okay. This person, to help you a little bit, this, this person was healed by Jesus from some life-controlling problems. They also were the very first person to ever preach the full gospel message of Jesus dying, being buried and resurrected. They were single. Uh, they, I'm not sure of their age, but they had enough money to be able to follow Jesus and even support the rest of the team. So how are we going? Anyone? Oh, I think you're stumping them. They're, we're stumping them. Okay. I like it. I like it a lot. Well, they, whenever their name is mentioned in the gospel stories, they're mentioned first before anyone else if there's a list of names because they were a natural leader. They came from a little village in Galilee called Magdala. How are we going? Anyone there, Amy? Mm, no. Come on, be brave. Where I are know. you? There's, There's a bunny at <coughs> stake here. The I bunny know. At stake got, likes. So now maybe this may help. They were the very first person to see Jesus risen from the dead. So how are we going? Mm. First person to ever see Jesus risen from the dead. Now, when I said one of Jesus' disciples, I I didn't say one of the 12. I said one of his disciples. I, I, I wasn't even saying a male. See, some of you are assuming that it's a male. Oh, hang on, it Denise. Be... Well, Denise thinks it's John, so I, I don't know where no, she gets that No, it's not John. <laughs> I think I'm, I've, this is a female, right? So I can't get much clearer than that. 
Dave's smiling behind the camera. He, he's worked it out. He's with us. So how are we going? A female? It might take them a little bit of time to... Oh, oh, Kath Raymond. Yes. She's yes. guessed a female. Okay, who is it? is it? She's guessed Mary. Mary. Which Mary? There's a whole stack of Marys. There's a whole Come on, stack Kath. of Marys. You've got to be a little bit more specific. Mary, Mary, quite contrary? No, not Mary, oh. Mary, quite contrary. Come on, Kath, quickly. Have a go. Wait, before Risk someone it. jumps in. Someone else could. Mary who? Ellie says Mary too. Yeah, but which Mary? Oh. Can anyone help us? Come on, Elle, jump in. Jump in before Come on, Kat we're going, 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 going. Dave's so keen to talk. You can't, Dave. No. <laughs> who are we going for? Anyone? Oh, give them a bit of time. Well, the thing that amazes... Oh, oh Kath, Kath's got it. Yes. Magdalene. Mary Magdalene. Yes. Okay. Well so done, Kath. With, with this, we'll post this to you, Kath. We'll get it to you somehow. So well I could, done. I could crush it down really firm so we that we could. don't have to pay as much postage. Okay. Yeah. That's yeah. A, that's so it becomes a, a letter idea. and not a parcel. What if you, you actually melted it, it would make it even flatter. I could just consume it for her. That's true. <laughs> Save the postage. Do it for okay. the team. So thank you, Amy. Well done. Well done to Kath. Um, that's that's pretty fantastic. Now, what we're going to do is have a look through Mary's eyes at the impact on her life of the resurrection. Now, Mary Magdalene, I find very, very fascinating because of all the people that Jesus could have chosen to communicate that he was risen from the dead, the first person to show himself that he would then give her the responsibility of taking the message of him being back from the dead. He gives it to a woman in a very male-dominated culture. Of all the people, this, this most historic moment in the history of life where God's son is, is put to death and comes back to life, God chooses this, this, this moment to be revealed to one person initially. It's a woman and it's Mary. And then she is given the task of taking this good news to the men and communicating with them what has happened. To actually look at the life of Mary and to see this moment in time where Jesus comes back to life, we need to really look at the fact that she is at the cross, at the crucifixion, all day supporting Jesus there with Jesus' mother when a lot of the men had disappeared. And in our family, my grandmother received a painting. It's a, it's a, it, it, it's a compiction, it's a picture of the cross, and it's the two Marys. And this was done, and it was given to my grandparents in 1949, and it was done from a family friend that obviously had a lot of uh, emotion and response to what Mary had done in the life of Jesus and his impact on her. And this painting was then handed on to my mum and then on to me. And so in this, in this picture, the artist tried to portray the cross being reflected back into the two Mary's eyes. That's the background to the lead up of Sunday morning. She not only was there with Jesus the whole time, watched him die, watched him brought down from the cross, and carried to the grave and she followed along behind and she watched them bury Jesus and then she went home. But she was not from Jerusalem and yet she was able to then find her way in the dark the next morning to, by herself, to arrive at the tomb only to find that the stone has been rolled away. I don't know the place you've been in your life where you've been confused by what's going on where you can't understand what's going on but that's where Mary was she was completely unprepared for Jesus dying she had no concept of him ever coming back to life and so so this was the darkest time of her life and there's no explanations and that's where Mary was is and, and I know that some of you have been there too but what Mary did was she wasn't going to let go of Jesus she, she didn't know what she was doing, but she wasn't going to let go. So she arrived by herself in the dark on this Easter Sunday morning. The stone's been rolled back. All she knows is that Jesus' body has been stolen. She's not expecting him to come back to life. 
So she runs and she runs back and she wakes up John and Peter and she grabs them and they run back and they outrun her and they arrive at the scene. Now, if you're thinking John is a really nice disciple of Jesus because he keeps telling us that he's the most loved, that the one Jesus loved, well, the guy was pretty competitive because in this story, from running from their home to the graveside, Three times John tells us that he beat Peter there. It's like, nah, 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 I beat you here. Three times he says, I got there first. I, I outrun him. I was there first. And then he says, and Peter, the idiot, gets there after me because he's slow and fat. And then he just barges in down into the tomb. And John's saying, I'm, I had too much respect. I, I wouldn't do that. But then he comes in after Jesus after Peter, sorry, and and he actually tells us that when he saw the empty tomb, he believed. But Peter, he was too thick. He didn't get it. Then they went back home, leaving Mary there by herself. Now Mary is crying. She's she. There's no answer to the, who's stolen the body. She's crying, and she looks down into the tomb, and sees two angels. And she, they ask her why she's crying. And she explains that someone has stolen the body of Jesus and she doesn't know where they've laid him. Then, as she turns, she sees, who is, she sees this male figure, a person. And she assumes that it's the gardener. And, she, and in her through her tears, remember this is like it's been dark, the sun's just coming up in the half light, she says to this who she thinks is the gardener, if you have taken his body, tell me where it is so that I can go get him. I don't know how she as a woman was going to carry this body of Jesus back to wherever she thought he had taken it. And the, and the gardener who wasn't the gardener, who was Jesus, he asks her this question, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? Jesus never ever asks a question for him to gain knowledge. He asks questions only for us to learn, for us to understand what's going on. It's a brilliant question, but Mary is going to answer it on the surface. She's not going to say she's crying because her world has collapsed, her dreams have gone, the trust she had in Jesus is gone. She's not going to explain all that, so she just says to who she thinks is the gardener, someone stole the body of Jesus. Do you know where it is? And then Jesus says to her, Mary. See, Mary has been focused on looking for a dead Jesus. And Jesus wants to show her that he's alive. He wants to reveal to her that he's alive. There are people on this earth that see Jesus as a dead Jesus. That's all they can see. And that's all Mary could see. But Jesus is trying to show her that he's alive. And his response to her by calling her by name, revealed who she was, what who he is. And so Mary then calls him out by name, goes to grab him and hug him, and, and, and her response was so natural. And Jesus does something that I've never really understood, even until I started preparing this message. He does... Ah, stop. No, you, you can't touch me, Mary. You can't. I've still, I've still got to go. I've got to go back to the Father. I've got to, I've got to go up to, to tell, tell the disciples that I'm alive, but tell them that I'm going up to God, their God. I'm going up to my Father, to their Father. The reason I've never understood it is because in the King James it says ascend. The word, a really common Greek word. That means to go up, like you'd go up to Sydney, you'd go up to Brisbane, is translated ascend. And so it leaves you thinking that Jesus says, you can't touch me, I've got to ascend back to God. But that's not what it was about. Jesus had a task. If you go forward one hour from this, the women come back again and they meet Jesus and he allows them to fall at his feet, to hang on to him, to touch him, to worship him. Later that day, he allows the disciples, when he appears to them, 
He says, touch my body, feel it, handle it. I'm real. I'm not a ghost. So what happened in that hour? Why, why when he told Mary to go back to the disciples, to tell them he's alive, he gave them this detail. He said, you can't touch me yet because I've still got to do some business with God. He was saying, I've got to go up to the temple. It's the same as when he healed a leper and, and he said to him, don't go talking, don't have a big party yet. Go straight to the, to the temple and you have been unclean. Have them declare you clean. And Jesus has been in the grave. He has taken sin, all our sin upon himself, and he's going to present himself to God in the temple as clean, as a risen saviour. And then he's free to do all the things that happened the rest of that day. So what was the impact on Mary of Jesus rising from the dead? I think it's really simple. He proved she could trust him. She began believing in Jesus and then all her dreams, her trust in Jesus was gone. She didn't have a capacity to understand. And yet when Jesus came back from the dead, Everything that she'd believed about him, everything she'd trusted him, the way he'd healed her, it all made sense. Everything that she had put on him had not been let down, had not been disappointed. And she was able to trust him for the rest of her life. And, and the purpose that that gave her was amazing. There's another character in the Bible that I want us to look at. And it's actually Jesus' brother. And I want us to look at how he saw the resurrection. Because I don't know what it would take for one of your siblings, a brother or a sister, or someone close to you and your family, what would it take for them to convince you that they were the saviour of the world, that God had sent them to, to redeem the world, to save the world? What would it take? Well, James, unlike Mary, Mary began, she's a believer, she's following Jesus. But James, he's sceptical. He doesn't trust anything that Jesus has been doing. He actually thinks his brother's lost it mentally. He doesn't believe anything that Jesus is, is saying about himself. Even the miracles, that didn't convince James at all. Only one thing changed James' life forever. It was called an event. It was the resurrection. And it changed James from a skeptic to a full believer. In fact, he wrote a book in the New Testament. And as he begins that book, he begins by saying, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. He died a martyr for a brother that he began skeptical in. There's two people in Jesus' life. One who just believed him. One who was a skeptic. But both through the resurrection had this life change for them both now i said there was a twist we're going to look at the resurrection through another set of eyes and it's not going to be someone that existed two thousand years ago the set of eyes that we're going to look at the resurrection through are your eyes how do you see how do you see a live jesus how does that influence and and impact your life for for some of you you believe and you know what he's done in your life. For some of you, you're still skeptical. You think this Jesus was real, that he died, but, but is he a live, living Jesus like he became to Mary? Is he a live, living brother that was killed and come back for James, changed him from a skeptic into someone that would serve Jesus as his Lord and Master? And so what I've done, I've asked two people from Red Gum to share what this means to them. And the first person we're going to hear from is Steve. Thanks. G'day. What does the open tomb mean to me? Well, it means peace. I paused for effect there. Did it work? <laughs> uh, thank you, Chelsea, for, uh, for being on the camera today. Um, the open tomb. 
if Jesus died for our sins, and I believe he did, and he didn't raise, rise from the dead, then his sacrifice has less power. He did rise from the dead. The Bible says it, I believe it. And uh, that's exciting news. Just recently, we lost a nephew, James. And uh, he's 14 and a half, pretty young lad. And he'd battled with some health issues for a little while. And uh, we said goodbye to him, I think Thursday, a bit over two weeks ago. Um, he passed away at home with his mum and dad by his side and uh, it's been, a, it's been a, tough, a tough couple of weeks. There is a confident hope I have, a confident hope that I have for James. He's, he's in heaven. He's not in pain anymore. He's got a new body and because he was peg fed his whole life, he, he never ate food like you and I eat food. So could you imagine his first meal? <laughs> G'day! What does the open tomb mean to me? Well, it means peace. I paused for effect there. Did it work? <laughs> uh, thank you, Chelsea, for, uh, for being on the camera today. Um, the open tomb. If Jesus died for our sins, and I believe he did, and he didn't raise, rise from the dead, then his sacrifice has less power. The resurrection is the one thing Okay, I think we're having some slight technical problems there. Um, this, we're all learning on the job, and it's it's a challenge. We uh, right now, Lauren's got her head flat on the desk. Um, don't pound your head into the desk, Lauren. Are we are we going to be able to go to Dave? Can someone put a, a thumbs up with Dave up the right way? We don't know. And so, being live is fun because we're trying. We we're not really professional at this but we're having a go okay dave's giving us a little glimpse as what's happening behind the scenes yes so can we go with we're going to try we're going to give it another crack and here is dave stork thank you the resurrection is the one thing that makes this more than just a book more than just scripture, more than just something that's got interesting stories and good tips for living a life. It talks in here that, that sin causes death. It causes death to relationships. It causes death to us as people. Um, but it also says that it causes and brings eternal death. But it gives some good instructions in the fact that it says that if you make a sacrifice, then that pays for that death, that pays for that sin. And then it goes on to say, well, this is a dude called Jesus who comes and lives and then he dies for my sin. Which sounds pretty cool, but any fool can die for another person. How did I know that he actually died for my sin? And even if he did, so what? It's just another person. But it's the resurrection that doesn't actually make sense. If he was just another person, then how could he resur be re resurrected? Unless, of course, he beat death. If he beat death and he died for my sins, then I, I'm ever forever able to live without sin, to be free. So the resurrection to me makes this not just a good book. It's what makes this the truth.
Okay, we're back live again. So thank you for for um, traveling the journey with us with trying to get this thing out to you guys. And and as someone just said in the room a moment ago, we are real. We, we may not be polished, but we're real. So what I loved about when Steve shared, he talked about this peace that God gave him. And when you consider that even for the, the funeral of young James when he died, they couldn't be there. The best that Steve could do was to stand with his family on the side of a bitumen road and watch the hearse go past and not actually be there to support his own brother and their family while I'm going through. And last night, I got a phone call from someone that doesn't have the peace that Steve has, that his family has. And this person was, is a son of a friend of mine. And this friend, we lived beside them, our neighbour, for 12 years in Sydney. And his son rang me last night to say that his dad, my friend, at 67, had had a massive heart attack and died. And, it, and, and the circumstances around that were really traumatic, traumatic to his mum, to Dawn, our, our, our really special friend. And, and so traumatic. This happened three weeks ago, but... The effect of what happened the next day, she had a heart attack herself and ended up in intensive care for three days. And the whole family is struggling with this sudden death of um, Tom, of not being able to have a proper funeral. There is no peace in their home. And there are people all over Australia, in our communities, in our families that don't have peace, like Steve shared about. And when Dave talked about the fact that Jesus defeated sin, defeated death, and that, that he can live free, that, that it's not just about behavioral modification for Dave. This is a freedom that he lives in. It's powerful. The resurrection of Jesus changes everything if you will allow the, the truth and the reality to, to have an impact on you and to go from a skeptic to someone that believes, to go from a believer that has put trust in God and when things can't be explained and when things go wrong, to still keep hanging on, to still keep hanging on to Jesus and not let go like Mary did. So thank you for being part of today. I'm just going to flick back over to Amy and we're going to do one more song and then she's going to finish up. And so Amy, thank you and over to you. Thanks, Lex. This song that we're singing next... Um allows us to worship Jesus for the powerful, resurrected God that he is. We sing what a beautiful name, we sing what a wonderful name and what a powerful name. And in as we sing, I encourage you to celebrate that we are celebrating a resurrected Jesus, not one who um, is gone but is in us and with us through the Holy Spirit. So let's sing. What could separate 
So it's my prayer for you that as you go forward today and continue on in this interesting time that we're in, that you will know not just the beauty of Jesus' name, but the wonder and the power as we celebrate what it is to have a resurrected Jesus. Don't forget, on Wednesday, we have a Zoom meeting for all Red Gummers. Um, love to connect with you that way. It's very funny to see the different ways that people embrace technology. <laughs> <laughs> and um, even, even today, Amy. Even today. That's right. That's right. I'm so proud of us. I'm so <laughs> proud of us. And um, and otherwise, we'll see you here t- next Sunday morning. See you later, everybody. Yep. See ya. See Bye. you, Alex. Bye.